welcome to Unstoppable Real Estate Investing Wealth. My name is Billy Alvaro, a.k.a. The Unstoppable VA, former billion-dollar mortgage banker, gone bankrupt, turned professional real estate investor, where each week you'll learn the tools, strategies, systems, and secrets myself and other highly successful real estate investing entrepreneurs use to start, grow, and scale their businesses, creating massive profits and how you can too. And we'll teach you how to put those profits to work so you no longer have to. Get ready to finally experience financial freedom and generational wealth. Now let's get started. Welcome back, everybody, to the next episode. I am Billy Alvaro, the Unstoppable BA, and this is Unstoppable REI Wealth. And if you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you know this is all about teaching you how to start, grow, and eventually scale your real estate investment business. Now, Today's episode is going to be a killer episode for many reasons. I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, but first, if you're new to the show, look, I know you can watch many podcasts out there, listen to many podcasts out there. So I want you to know that how much I appreciate you tuning in and listening. If you want to learn the tools, tips, tips, and, str and strategies and secrets that I've used and my guests use, just go to billysecrets.com. On there, most of the tools that we speak about are going to be on there. Also, if you're looking to partner on deals, take your company to the next level, joint venture, even do some sort of money lending, go to BillyAlvaro.com, fill out the form on there. We can connect and figure out how we can start doing business together. Now, this, the guest I'm bringing on today, this gentleman comes from New Zealand. I've known him now for about four years, met him at Collective Genius, and he has an incredible story, but he is living proof that when you structure your business the right way, the trajectory of where you can go, it, it's in my mind, it's it's stratospheric and it's unbelievable. His his business has grown substantially in the last two years since he's brought on his COO. And I'm gonna introduce him now, Mark Delator. Mark, welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks, Billy. Great to be here, mate. Always enjoy spending time with you. Appreciate you coming on, man. So listen, let's get a quick backstory, five minutes of how you got into this business and where you're from, because we everybody can listen to that accent of yours, and we know it's not from Australia. So where's no, it? No, well done. No, uh, born and raised in New Zealand, um, and and proud uh, proud New Zealander. Um, I wish I could go back more often, but obviously, as you know, COVID is kind of putting a kibosh on that right now. With uh, you know this two week mandatory quarantine that they force you into. But yeah, yeah, I uh, came over here as a, a tennis player um, and played four years on the uh, collegiate tennis circuit. Um, got my undergraduate degree. Uh, stayed on, got my MBA, and uh, fell in love. Got married um, right as right after I graduated. Um, so tennis brought me to America. Love kept me here, um, and it was kind of love at first flip for me. Also, in that I uh, flipped a house when I was getting my MBA um, right out the summer after I got my MBA, and so I've never really had a job, Billy. I just flipped that one house and accidentally, you know, made twenty five k. And I'm thinking, why would I go work for you know, 40 grand a year and I can, you know, take a couple of months and go do that. So luckily my wife was a nurse. And so we lived off her, uh, her meager hourly wage for a few years. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of getting boots on the ground and figuring everything out. But, um, yeah, looking back 20 years later, it's been, it's been quite a ride. 20 years. It goes by quick, man, doesn't it? Mate, it, it sure does. Like this snap of the fingers. And before you know it, your kids are growing, they're off to college and having a family of their own. It's crazy. So, Mark, you you have a niche, the business you're in. I know it's morphed over the years. I don't know if you ever really did wholesaling, but I know you were a rehabber back in the day. Now you're really a turnkey provider. So for people that are listening to the show that are not familiar with the word turnkey provider, what does that actually mean? Yeah, sure. A turnkey provider is essentially a flipper, only you've already got the buyer in your pocket and you don't need to pay a real estate commission. So the beautiful thing is most people step over those hundred to $150,000 homes because they're not really, they're more rental properties than, than flips, right? So most people would kind of flip in the, you know, the 150 to 550 range, at least in the Kansas City marketplace. We actually take, we don't do any of the small, small inner city properties or anything. We focus in A-class areas as kind of our niche. But we take properties that um, are designed to be nice suburban areas as rental properties, and we actually you know, obviously, you know, like anyone else, we advertise and target to buy them under market value, but then we do a really quality remodel, attracting a super high quality tenant. And then we, once the property is tenanted and, uh, you know, already, you know, rented out, rehabbed and rented out, we then, and only then do we sell it 
to an investor that's kind of sitting there saying, hey, Mark, I'd like to buy as many rental properties as I can. I just don't have the time or money how to do it. So we call it a full turnkey operation because we have high income, high net worth individuals that are wanting to build a portfolio of rental properties, but we do everything for them. We take all the mistakes out of it because they don't need to go kick their teeth in. Um, in fact, <laughs> I say that most of them are dentists, doctors, lawyers, accountants, um, yeah. high income individuals that you know see value in, in real estate over the stock market. But I think the real estate industry for the longest time has done a very poor job of catering to the investor. You know, when you sign up for an entry level job, they say, you know, we'll we'll match for your 401k. And they're like, okay, so everyone just starts pouring their money into the stock market. Um, I think we need to step up a little. And my my vision, my big goal is to make real estate investing as easy as investing in the stock market. I love it. So so your business multifaceted then you're not only going after product, you're going after the buyers. So you have two different marketing campaigns going simultaneously to bring in both of those? Correct. Well, yes and no, um, for sure. So we have four divisions of the company. We have a huge acquisitions department, which is you can, you, this is what you do on a, on a daily basis as well, which is, you know, advertising and marketing and generating leads and taking phone calls and, you know, going in the living room, getting the appointment, appointment to contract, contract yeah. to close, all that kind of thing. So we're really trying to generate as many deals as we can off market deals. We take those and then we got to rehab them. And we, unlike, we've never wholesaled, so we don't do any wholesale at all. Um, so we're rehabbing everything. So when we buy 300 houses a year, Billy, we are remodeling 300 houses. So brain damage, um, yeah. you know, it's a it's a big lift. But then we take all of those and then we get them all rented out. And then we, uh, you know, have this big property management company as well, obviously, to, to cater and, and house and, and manage all those. And yeah, and then we're blessed because um, we've partnered with uh, Dr. David Phelps. So we're part of the Freedom Founders community, which delivers us quite a few um, buyers, probably half of our buyers come from the Freedom Founders community. Um, and then the other half are just loyal people that have kind of been with me over the years. And what I learned over the years is that, um, you know, wealthy people talk to wealthy people about um, where they're investing and what kind of returns they're getting. And they come from a place of abundance mindset rather than scarcity. So they're not afraid to tell people, oh yeah, this guy Mark's just crushing it in real estate and he's delivering me amazing returns. I'm getting you know, 14 to 20 percent returns on my money, you should go talk to him. And so it's really just been a referral based business from the get go as far as the sales side of things. I love it, dude. You are dialed in and making shit happen. Now, when you first came into CG years back, how long have you been in now? Five years? Five years. Yep. Five years. So I, I don't know exactly what year it was, but I remember you were going through a struggle on the acquisition of property side because that whole market started to change. Yeah. If I recall correctly, you were buying a shit ton of your properties at the steps. Market started to shift. And you're like, what do I do? <laughs> How am I going to do this? So tell us what you're doing today. How many different arms do you have to acquire properties? What does that look yeah, like? Yeah, mate, that, that is probably something that, that your listeners would get the most value from my commentary on because um, what everyone should do is not put all their eggs in one basket in any of your uh, facets of your business. And on acquisitions, we were a one trick pony. Um, I mean, you would occasionally scour the MLS and maybe pick one or two, three deals a year from that. I mean, it was nothing we had focused on because, you know, we're like, oh, we can just get as much as we want from the courthouse steps. So back in the day, we were consistently buying about 100 properties a year from yes. 2011 all the way through 2017. Just every year, 100 homes, 100 homes, 150 homes, 110 homes. We could always clip off about 100 homes a year on the courthouse steps. And then all of a sudden I saw auction.com come into the marketplace and start, you know, giving people that that information that used to be not proprietary, but it was certainly very hard to get. And you had to kind of yep. have to have good systems and process to be able to get the information from the trustees, you know, chase down the deals, investigate the homes, talk to the neighbors, do your due diligence and have someone show up live in person on the courthouse steps to bid on the house. Well, now you just go to auction.com and they say, yeah, in, in two weeks time, at this date, at this time, you can come and here's the opening bid. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was way, way easier for people. And we started seeing more and more and more competition. And I could just see that uh, kind of going going by the wayside. And so nowadays, um, goodness, I can't even count the ways. Um, first of all, we work with wholesalers. We've really embraced working with wholesalers to bring us deal flow. Realtors, um, we do television, radio, billboard advertising. SEO, PPC, I mean, you know, direct to sale marketing with letters, postcards. So, I mean, there's 10 ways right there that we yeah. you know, are now bringing deal flow into our 
uh, pipeline. And um, you, you have to embrace a multifaceted approach to acquisitions because we're in the most competitive uh, time right now for, you know, everyone wants to be a real estate investor. And so to be able to go and, you know, buy 300 homes in a year, um, you got to have your shit dialed in. And is that what you're doing now? Roughly 300 a year? Yeah, this year we'll do 296, which is just right. math. I mean, I, I keep saying, telling team, why not 300? And they're like, hey, we know our numbers. It's going to be 296. I'm like, okay. So I, I say 300 and then they're going to, uh, you know, kind of be irritated when they get to their 296 number. But yeah, they tell the team tells me 296 in, uh, in five different markets right now. So I don't want to gloss over what you said because this is important. I get this question asked me all the time. Billy, how are you doing the volume you do? What is the secret? What marketing secret do you deploy in order to get the deals you're getting? And basically, there is no secret. You just hit it on the head. You have to have an octopus with a lot of legs, a lot of tentacles that are going out there, and you're going to get a return of three, four, five X on each different marketing arm. But no one arm, in my view, no one arm nowadays is killing it where you're getting a 10 X on your return on investment. It's no, always you know, three, four, five. Yeah. And you notice there that, that we're not doing texting. Uh, we are doing outbound dialing um, as well. So that would be your 10th. But we noticed we're not texting. We chose with all the legal stuff. We think that's a temporary thing. I know there's some people that are just crushing it right now. Um, our buddy Billy Ross out of um, Orlando is crushing it on texting. Yeah. Um, but it's just not something that we chose to, to go down that angle. But yes, the answer is, you know, it's hard work. And, and the hard work comes in the lead management. Um, we just hired our second lead manager um, and we're looking we're looking to hire a third because what we've noticed is that the lead management more so than the appointments the lead management cultivating that lead is so critical you know advertising dollars are like um, soldiers right and if you send one advertising dollar soldier out into the field he better run back with five of his buddies you know yeah. arm in arm otherwise you've lost the the power of that and so we are you know, hell bent on making sure that our ad dollars are, are being well spent. And that I, th I think most people don't realize that the money you're currently spending, whether it be in mail or whatever, you've got the leads that you need. You've just got to follow up with people. And people, you know, sometimes just don't get the yes on the first phone call and they think, oh, that guy's dead. It's like, oh, my gosh, dude. I mean, the number of deals, as you know, that come in, in between months three and months nine. Yeah. I mean, it's like a, a half of our deal flow comes. So that means you've got to have patience and follow up and systems and process to remind you to keep following back up with that person. Because when you're dealing with tens of thousands of leads, I mean, you're not going to remember which you know guy to call. You've got to have a system and software to remind you to follow up. So I want to pick your brain um, in regards to you're doing 300 deals a year, but you said you have right now currently just one lead manager. How in the hell is that person able to handle the lead flow coming in to book that many appointments for your outside acquisition managers? It yeah, has to be. Yeah. So for clarity, our acquisitions managers are responsible for their wholesale relationship. So that's only the phone ringing. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. So the wholesale and realtor, we have one. Um, acquisitions consultant that is um, just controlling our realtor relationships, one that's controlling our wholesale relationships. And then we have an acquisitions manager who helps, you know, with the, the lead manager as well. But yeah, he was getting overwhelmed for sure. Yeah. And he's now, now we've got a second one. We're actually going to get a third one. We just believe in that model of having, you know, your lead managers are really salespeople as well. And so we are um, making sure that we can fill the, that void and make sure that we're getting, because again, the lead manager, you know, it used to be, we used to call him inbound lead manager and now we just call him lead manager because we didn't want him thinking it was only the inbound calls. He was got. it's like, dude, you got an outbound dial as well. Yeah. So now he's just a lead manager and, and that's, he's got to jump on Facebook, on LinkedIn, you know, you know, all the different facets of, of lead generation. I mean, there's so many ways to talk to people. You just got to talk to people. Yeah, for sure. What, what my sales manager did, Justin, inside the office, probably seven months ago, we, uh, we implemented two additional lead managers. We have a total of three. And then we have three people in the Philippines that are like tier one, tier two. So as all the calls come in, the leads are coming in. My tier, my tier one's on the ground. I call them appointment setters. They're all day long just booking appointments and the leads coming in. And then my tier, one, tier two and three out in the Philippines, they're the overflow. They're diving deep into the database with those leads that we know that are in there that either never got booked or they got booked and the appointment got canceled or they never took the offer. And we're getting on average two, three deals a month from having the tier two and three dive deep into the database. And these leads that are coming out, they're 50, 60, $75,000 profit deals. I mean, it's worth its weight in gold to 
put a little bit of time and effort on setting that lead management piece up, that acquisitions piece, because it is where the money is, man. For sure. And, and I will fully disclose that um, although we're going to do huge volume this year, our acquisitions is probably the weakest part of our um, operation. Our strength is in you know, the property management and the rehab, um, you know, oh, we really, I got to put, put you on pause. You're doing 300 deals a year. How in the hell could you possibly say you guys are weak? Because we're still, we're not in the position where we're able to generate all of them. So we're 50% of those will be from wholesalers. And right? what about so, percentage from realtors? Um, probably only five or 7% from realtors. Okay. So, we're doing probably 40% from direct to seller and um, television and, and all that kind of stuff. We can just get way better at, at, at the acquisition side. So, you know, our big goal is to do a thousand a year, Billy. That's our BHAG is to get to a thousand homes a year. Now that's not all going to be, you know, rehab through us. Uh, we have a, we're, we believe that we can aggregate some of those deals with partners in different markets and new construction and that kind of thing. But um, that's, that's our big goal is to get to a thousand homes a year um, because there's demand for it. You know, it's silly for it to not cultivate when we, if I had 600 homes in our database that we could turn around, that were ready, rented out that I could sell tomorrow, I could get them all sold and under contract in probably two weeks. Wow. I mean, we have that much demand for the product, but we don't have the product um, to, to be able to push through the pipeline. And so my yeah. struggle is how can we service an industry that's being ignored right now, which is the turnkey space. There's so many investors that are, dismayed in the stock market, they've pulled, they've deleveraged from the stock market because as you know, that's hyperinflated right now. PE ratios are off the charts and yep. companies are being overvalued. So people are, are wisely pulling money from the market, but you got to put it somewhere. I don't know if you remember, Billy, about, even about um, 15 years ago, you could still get about a four or 5% return just sticking your money in the bank and getting a term deposit or a CD. You know, those days are gone. So yeah. you have to deploy your capital somewhere. So we're really focused on um, can't, you know, we're really big believers in this turnkey model. We feel like, you know, it's like a flip only you've got your buyer already lined up, so there's no risk. And so you don't have a buyer's agent you have to deal with and you get them pre, you, we're actually mandating that they all pay cash now. So now you've got a, a cash buyer for your flip already lined up and we're closing our deals within 10 days of rehab getting completed. That's, that's incredible. What's your average profit per deal on the turnkey, in the turnkey space? Our goals, uh, they're currently hovering around 23 or 24. Um, we can probably grind that up into the 25 to 27 range. You're the third person over the last two weeks I've spoke to, and that seems to be right about the numbers between 20 and 25 in the turnkey space is where they're pulling down. North Carolina area, South Carolina, Midwest, those seem to be the numbers. I want to, Mark, I want to get into, because um, you're doing 300 rehabs a year. So, Talk to our audience in regards to the rehab side of your company. Do you own a construction company or do you third party it out to contractors and have rehab managers? Both and right. You can't you can't do either. I'm not going to you know have a construction company that manages 300 homes. That would be out of my control and out of my depth, um, especially all around the country to manage that. That truly is you have to be solely as a construction company first and foremost. So we partner, right? I'm a big believer, Billy, in who, not how. It's not just how can I go do this? It's who can I collaborate with to make this a win-win situation? Yeah. So, you know, obviously in Kansas City, we're pretty dialed in because we've been here 20 years. But the, the struggle for us was, you know, how do we scale into other markets? I do not want to go start hiring and, and managing people in Alabama or uh, uh, Iowa or Illinois or Nebraska, you know, and all these other states that we're operating in. Um, so we, partnered, we found um, nationwide construction companies. We brought them into Kansas City. We did some deals with them in Kansas City so they could see our model. They could walk it. We could kind of go through that painful, you know, like them not living up to our quality standard and them getting, to, you know, hiring the right people and holding people accountable. But once we've done that for about, um, I don't know, about 18 months. And so now we feel comfortable um, that for the last year we've been like, OK, now we feel comfortable that they can. It was about a six month kind of onboarding period, gestation period where we had to kind of make sure they were going to be the right fit. And then we allowed them to go into these other markets where they felt comfortable and already had teams lined up. But we're actually following after there's a uh, one of their contractors was Zillow and um, Main Street Renewal and, and uh, Tricon uh, Homes and American Homes for Rent. So it's like this big re construction companies that are working on behalf of these big REITs yeah. that, are, that are doing it nationwide. So we just went and found those construction companies 
and started working with them um, and getting them on board as to our system. And they love us, Billy, because, you know, we're spending 30 to 35 grand per house on a remodel, right? We're doing it right. We're putting in all new cabinets and granite and uh, gutting the bathrooms and doing all LVP flooring, no carpet. Whereas the hedge funds were just coming in, they were just painting the cabinets, carpet, paint the walls and we're done. You know, yeah. for Mica, they wouldn't even change the countertops. It was very nominal. They would be putting an average of seven to 10 grand per house and we're tripling that. So obviously that triples the revenue for the for the construction company. So it's been a, it's been a good fit and we feel like we can scale now into multiple markets. We just, so now it's a combination of where can we partner with people to bring us acquisition volume and where is our remodel strongest and let's put those two together because the, the reality is it doesn't matter where we go as long as we hit our numbers on the rehab on as long as we hit our numbers we can sell assets all over the midwest it doesn't Absolutely. i mean i'm not going to go turnkey in, in new york or california or florida but anywhere in the midwest we can just go repeat this model we have a rinse repeat model now so the the construction side of the business then do you have boots on the ground for project managers or is it 100 percent outsourced in the states other than kansas city i would say it's a hundred percent outsourced other than the wow. fact that our acquisitions we have one acquisitions guy in each market and he is responsible for walking the job and giving us a little bit of eyes and ears on the ground but you know you've got a good i i don't want to minimize the fact that the relationships we've created i would be comfortable with them being our eyes and ears on the ground because you know it, we've negotiated terms of net 30 days from punch list so i mean that's the other cool thing billy is we don't even have to come up with rehab money now because you know we're selling it you notice that, i don't know if that you that blew over your audience but Mark, did you just say that you're, you told me that you were selling the asset net 10 days after completion and yet your rehab bill is due net 30 days after completion. Is that right? That's yes, crazy. it is. So that's so how that is. Yeah. Where your brain starts. To, if you start thinking rather than just doing, you can start thinking, okay, how can I possibly get this to work a little bit smoother? You start taking a more holistic approach and, and start, you know, your CFO, you can sit down and say, okay, how can we make this, this game work a little bit easier? Um, but anyway, back to your question. Yes, the uh, the rehab guys, I would feel comfortable. You know, we have good software, good reporting. They have to post photos before they get paid, all that good stuff. We, we, we walk it, we punch it. You know, we're comfortable with what they have. And they're going to stand behind it because, again, we're not flipping this to an end user. We are, you know, effectively managing it forever on behalf of our owner. And so we will hold them accountable. So in each one of these states that you're in, you're in Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, Alabama, and Nebraska currently. Yep. And in each one of those states, you have a property management company that you own that manages the assets after you sell it over? Yeah, we have JV in Alabama with another property management company down there um, that's doing our PM for us. Again, our owners only know us, right? So all owner communication comes through our office and we virtually property manage. In some states, we're just doing it with we comfortable and we've got our license and we can just do it there. In other states where we're unlicensed, we partner with a property management company there and we just use their boots on the ground. Love it. And earlier in the conversation, you said for your investors, the returns they're getting. And I, I don't know if it was right. Did you say between 14 and 20 percent? Yes, sir. That's a that's a great number. So, yeah, so for clarity, it's yield of somewhere in the seven to eight percent range. But they're typically leveraging and obviously cash on cash returns exponential right now just because they can leverage it, you know, 3.85 to 4.5% yeah. on non-owner occupied investment property. But that's kicking our average uh, returns into the 14 to 20% range. That's that's insane. That is insane. All right. So now we've got a good understanding of how your company started, what you're doing volume wise. Let's talk now about two and a half years ago where you were, because I know you were a CEO that was probably working what 18 hour days and doing everything, if I recall. And you were going through some, maybe it was three years ago, you were going through some internal struggles, some external struggles where you're like, look, I really want to take this thing to the next level. And you're a bright guy, Mark. I mean, no two ways about it. You're sharp. You know what you're doing. But we all know we can't do this by ourselves. We need a second in command to take the vision of the visionary to really execute and implement. So let's go back two and a half, three years ago where you were and what's changed and how that's impacted your business. Because this is really where the scale part comes into play. Billy, you're wanting me to go back to a dark place, aren't you? <laughs> I do. I want you to go back there and feel it. Yeah. So, you know, th there is no such thing as a, a pure, you know, bread story, right? I mean, you know, Tom Brady was drafted in the sixth round. That must have been painful, him sitting in that room wondering if he's ever going to play in the NFL, right? And there's ups and downs and, and you know, tragedies and things that people overcome. So many stories um, of people overcoming 
tough times and I'm no exception. Um, I went through a very bitter business divorce in 2009 um, when, um, and, and we can, that's probably a deeper conversation for another day, but I was effectively, you know, millionaire by the age of 30 and then back to absolute zero. Didn't declare bankruptcy or everything, but everything was taken away from me. I had to start recharging. And so now I've like, I, it was almost that, that scars of like partnering with people that kept me from, from reaching out earlier. It was like, I screw everybody else. I'm going to do this on my own. So from 2009 all the way through 2017, I was just, just charging hard and I'd surround myself with uh, a bunch of helpers, a genius with a thousand helpers. Right. And I can do it all. And I'm going to teach them how to do it because I'm you know smart enough and I know how to do things. I'm going to get it done my way. Everything's going to be smooth. And, and we were force, force, forcing it up and, you know, making big money, Billy. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I'm not braggadocious at all, but it was, you know, up into the seven figures. And so you're, you're comfortable in that space, but you're just working your your tail your to the grind. You're, you're just nose to the grindstone every day. You work your tail off, and you know the the. I'm not a big believer in the work life balance. I think that you you have you know through everything you have to have that period in your life where you have to push super hard to make something you know truly you know come into greatness. Yeah. Um, however. I reached my boiling point in 2017. It was uh, just just too much. I mean, I was a genius with a thousand helpers, a solopreneur who had surrounded myself with just people that were doers and and not thinkers. Um, and it's I like to say it's easier to do than to think. It's easier to do something than to think. How could I get this done cleaner and easier and better? And I started reading a lot about business ownership and CEOing, and obviously. Um, embrace the EOS traction model. Um, and I started talking, you know, you say I was a CEO, I would not consider myself a CEO. I think that term is thrown around way too loosely as entrepreneurs. Um, I, I am truly CEOing now. Um, and the CEO only does three things. We can get to that. But I started looking at traction as the CEO, COO model. And I read a book called Rocket Fuel, which very clearly explained that vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> yeah. I think and I'm like, I'm a, such a true visionary. I mean, I have big dreams, big visions, big people, but my accountability, holding people accountable and execution is poor. And I force it through and make it happen if I have to, but that is not my skill set. And so I was looking for someone that could help me come in and be a COO. And so I finally found that person and that has transformed my business. Now, that has there was obviously pain in there because um, you know when I hired my COO Chris, he came in and you know quite frankly told me right up front. He said, "Look, I'm you know he's a he was a corporate sales guy, really good at accountability, process, execution, um, you know work orders, standard operating procedures, implementing process throughout an organization. So perfect COO." But his thing was, Mark, when I go in and, and you know carve out a, a new. Uh, you know, a new organization, there will be turnover. And I said, okay, I'm ready. But yeah, we, I mean, it was embarrassing how many people got turned over. And I felt bad because these are all good people. Um, they weren't up to the task. I mean, we, it's not like we fired everyone immediately. We set high standards and said, this is what we want you to do. And, the, and most of them just left because they couldn't ha hack it anymore. Um, and we just hired talent. We had a commitment in 2019 to hire talent. That was going to be our mantra. Our mantra in 2019 was higher talent. Our mantra in 2020 was um, velocity of capital, making sure that we turn things quicker and better. Because once you get the right people in the right seats, now it's like, okay, now let's run hard. You know, and so um, it's been a good transition, but it's been a long one. And we had a lot of turnover. Um, I've kind of unpacked a lot of stuff there. I'll let you get, kind of, you know, direct the, the traffic here. Yeah, yeah. So to give the audience perspective, right, when, when Chris came in, your COO, how many people were in your organization, including yourself? Uh, 14. You had 14. And 18 months later, of those 14, when Chris did his thing and he went through his whole process, how many of the 14 were left? We have one left. That's incredible, dude. I want, I want people to hear that. So it's not that you had the mm -hmm. wrong people. You had the right people to get you to where you needed to go at that point. But for you to get to the absolute next level, you needed them to level up. And one out of the 14 had the ability or capabilities to actually elevate themselves to the next level is what I'm hearing. Yeah, it's a real challenge as a small business owner. Um, I take no pride, by the way, in saying that all those people are gone. I, I own that and I, I'm still friends with most of them. Um, 
you know, obviously some took that as, you know, the ones that were actually fired because they couldn't hack it, obviously took it, um, you know, and, and, you know, they probably are not huge fans of, of me or the company anymore. But, you know, it, it, as the business owner, as a true CEO, you have to make tough decisions. And, you know, as long as you are clear and honest and transparent with where your company is going, you have to honor the fact that if those people are not going to get through the, get you there, that it's best for them too. Most of them will look back in two years time and say, Mark, thank you for letting me go because I found a great place. I'm much more comfortable where I'm at. If they were truly honest, they would say, I was stressed because I wasn't able to deliver what you were wanting me to deliver. Yep. And so the challenge as a small business owner is just identifying talent and holding on to the best talent. One of the mistakes I made early, Billy, which I will never make again, and um, is just trying to get the best person for a set amount of money. Right. So I'll say, OK, well, this I, I can hire someone for fifty thousand dollars a year. OK, well, if there was someone out there that I would have had to pay seventy five grand to get that would just just crush and, and be really, really good. I would be ignoring them because I had a budget of fifty thousand. I just had to get the best person for that amount of money. Now, I very rarely do I go into a job description or job posting thinking how much, um, you know, what is the cap of what I'm going to pay them if someone impresses me then, you know, you do what you can to attract that talent. Now, obviously, within reason, right? I mean, there's, you know, there are reasonably, there are reasonable expectations for a position, but you can't be closed minded because when you have a talented individual come in, um, for example, our lead property manager is a guy that um, has come in and just transformed that department. He's really taken ownership. I have almost zero day to day. Um, well, I have zero day to day running in the, in the uh, property management company right now. We're managing well over 600 doors. Um, you know, to be able to say that out loud, I mean, it's just a nice little annuity. I mean, it's a business in and of itself and I have nothing to do with it. You know, there's, there's a joy and a peace of, uh, you know, that, that comes with knowing that everything's going to have quality decisions and, you know, and it's not just that he's maintaining, he's accelerating, right? He's a leader. So he's trying to grow the business, implement process, incorporate and bolt on new additions, new revenue streams, better service to our owners. And, you know, he's, he's leading a company. And when you give them ownership and, and uh, you know, you know, give them revenue share or whatever you can do to get them really bought in, um, you know, you get some acceleration through that. It's important you say that. I think the revenue share piece, if it's, if it's put together the right way, could really propel your company if you have the right person on the execution side. I mean, look, look what Chris did. I saw his presentation at CG, I think about a year and a half ago. And I mean, just the guy just came in, you hired the right person for that position. And I know it wasn't easy for you because you went through this once before and hired somebody and it was the wrong person for that position. So you took a, a bet on them and it's it's paying off tenfold, if not more. Yeah, tenfold, literally. So we'll do 10x from where we were probably in about a five year time period. So um, yeah, super strong. And that's 10x net, brother. So I mean, you know, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, it's really freed my time up to think and do what I'm meant to be doing. A CEO, a board business owner, should only be doing three things, right? A CEO should be looking at vision and strategy, people and talent, and making sure that the cash is in place to, to execute on focus on daily. Um, but yeah, I, if your audience is out there and I know you have that model of, um, uh, can you remind me again the three phases? It's like start, start grow, scale. St okay, start, grow, scale. So for those that are in the start and grow phase, do not jump out and hire someone immediately, right? You, you know, that's not the intent of this. Once you're growing and hyper growth phase, that's when you should be looking to have a, an operations guy come, come on board or just be, if you're starting, uh, there are some people that are blessed. You know, we have people inside CG, as you know, Billy, that kind of were, you know, really good owner operators um, that had like a visionary COO right from the get go. And the business has done well because of that. I just wasn't that way. I was having to fill both seats. And when you, I think everyone should kind of um, do some kind of inward or self-reflection saying, what is my best role? I would highly recommend Rocket Fuel. Um, it's a small, easier to read book that will define you. Are you the visionary or the COO or are you a unique combination of the two? If you're the combination of the two, you're going to have to choose which way you go. But if you're a visionary, like most young entrepreneurs are, um, it takes a lot of guts to say, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to do this. I mean, most people don't. 96% of companies never make more than a million dollars a year. And so when you're in the top 4%, which is going to make more than a million, you know, that takes a lot of skill and execution and understanding that you've got to have the right people around you to elevate you to the next level is just one of those natural progressions that you're going to have to elevate to. But if I had been told that, you know, from a younger age, Billy, it would have saved me a lot of, a lot of heartache. 
you have, a, you know, an edge over a lot of entrepreneurs, Mark, because you are educated. You have your MBA. A lot of guys that get into this space and other spaces, entrepreneurs, they've quit college. They don't. So you have that professional background and you but you never actually took a job. You went from MBA to flipping right <laughs> right into this business like. Yeah, I would say my MBA, uh, I, I felt a little out of place getting my MBA when I was, uh, what would that have been, you know, 23. Um, most of the people in the MBA class were obviously in their 30s and 40s. Um, but I was able to to glean from that, you know, so I had very little practical experience, right, other than internships and small little, you know, part-time jobs here and there. So I didn't have much experience. Um, and so I leaned on them and then was kind of one of those kids that just absorbed a lot through my MBA rather than contributed more, you know, like I normally would have done through my undergrad. Um, and so it was it was also a combination of just knowing I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't just want to go get a job. Um, I had an entrepreneurial burning desire in my in my brain. And I'd read Rich Dad Poor Dad at an early age. Um, so I knew that real estate was going to be a wealth building tool for me over time. Um, biggest no brainer ever is just buy real estate and hold. I mean, you know, it's just for those that don't understand, it's just buy as much as you can now and just hold on forever. And you're going to look like a, a genius in 10 or 20 years time. Um, but for those that are, you know, yeah, education was, was great for me, but for those out there thinking, how can I, obviously you don't have to go back and get your MBA right now. I would be an MBA of as, reading as many books as you can do behind me. You can't, well, I don't know for the audience. This is my, this is my MBA right there, bro. I mean, for those of the people that don't read, I just kind of impress upon you enough. Everything out there um, that you need has already been written and documented, and you should be reading and absorbing as much as possible. Um, my goal actually this year is to read 52 books and you know, and take from that what I will to implement to the business. But again, that's I've freed up some time to be able to have, now I'm working a three and a half hour work week. So Thursday afternoons and Fridays are just my downtime and maybe one round of golf, a lot of book reading, time with the wife. You know, trying to work on, you know, just, you know, becoming who I want to be, Billy. Life, life is a lot different than what it was three years ago. Yeah. And it's all about hiring the right people. I mean, Chris is in a place where he's just loving life as well. He was in the corporate grind, um, hated what he was doing. And, you know, we've given him a breath of fresh air. I mean, he's I kind of see myself in him now because, you know, he's running into that site. He's like, oh, dude, like contractors like did you? this guy didn't call me back. I'm like, yeah, no shit, bro. <laughs> You know, he's like the same little things that like you can see yourself saying like 15, 20 years ago. And he's, he's yeah. kind of coming into that, that, you know, he's learning real estate. And so it's it's fun. But he has so much vim and vigor because it's this new lease on life. And and he's making more money now than he did in corporate. And so he's happy. And, and, and him he, the freedom he, back. He, he treats the business like his own. So it's, it's great. Him the, the freedom, Mark, like you've given him the reins. Like I remember one of the presentations you said to him, look, like the decisions on you. When there's issues with something that goes on, you don't want the employees or the staff to come to anymore. And that, just talk about that for two, three minutes. How was that a tough decision for you to make as the person who always made the decisions, the guy who was always there to solve the problems, to be like, I'm going to hand the reins over and have Chris now handle this? Was that yeah, tough? For, for sure. So, for every entrepreneur out there, listen up, because this was when you get to that point where you actually hand the reins over, you have to do it in a way that honors and respects your entire organization. So you have to honor the COO and his ability. You cannot undermine him. Um, it's a lot of retraining the organization. And uh, some people, you know, took a little, you know, were a little butter when they come to my office and, and um, you have to kind of just train yourself to say, well, what did Chris say about that? Yep. You know, when they'd come and say, hey, Mark, what do you want to list this at? Well, what did Chris say about that? And then he would go to Chris and Chris would obviously rather than just telling him, which I would just told him what to list that Chris is smart enough to know. say, OK, well, what's your process on getting a list price for this property? Yeah. You know, well, I'm, I've run the comps and I think it's between this and this. OK, is that written down? Have you got a training manual for that? Because when you leave and elevate into a new position, we want the next person to come on board and be able to train and process and use the same form and document that you're currently using. I mean, it's just. Dude, my yeah. brain doesn't even go remotely there. It's it's out of my mind, like smart. Like, why wouldn't I have thought of that? But he's training. So when I would start seeing that, I'd be like, okay, I cannot answer any quick questions. So that's why I'm actually working from home today. I work home from uh, from home a little bit more just to kind of separate myself and understand that hey, Chris is at the shop. Yeah, he's the one running it, and you know they should go to him first. And then the other thing is, you know, you look at accountability chart and it kind of sits like COO with the one line down to the COO and then all the branches off the COO. I think if you put that, if people actually put up 
an organizational chart of what they want it to look like and then just say, hey, you cannot get to CEO without going through um, assistant manager, property manager, COO, and then to the CEO. So, if, you know, the, the, the role for the CEO, EO now, if some if a conversation ever gets to me, it should be A through Chris, but B, it should be, well, what did those three people say? Have you reached yeah. consensus yet? Why am I being involved in this? I mean, if it ever comes to me, it's normally just at an L10 um, or, you know, a discussion between Chris and I on our weekly weekly meeting. You brought up L10. I want to, want to pick your brain and then we're going to wrap up. So I know you're big into going to masterminds and educating yourself like a lot of entrepreneurs are. But on the personal side, did you have any business coaching that assisted you like one on one to get you to the next level? No, um, although I would um, give huge amount of credit to CG. Collective Genius was instrumental in transforming my uh, mindset um, to take it to the next level. The first year, I would say the first meeting, but really it was the first year. I just felt a little overwhelmed with the um, the operational excellence that was in the room, um, feeling like I, you know, cause all I did was go to the courthouse steps and raise my hand and we got a house, you know, what I probably, what I, the biggest thing I took away was that I needed to implement some process. So I came back and tried to implement EOS, obviously without a COO in place, I was not the person to be doing that. So we did it and kind of had good meetings, but it was still just not kick, clicking all cylinders because I hadn't delegated all the authority down to them it was still just Mark. It truly wasn't until I had someone that was running uh, the company and running EOS the right way, having an integrator um, that fits all the um, personality traits of holding people accountable. Accountability is just the biggest thing that I was lacking, Billy. I would too nice of a guy, um, you know, that would let people slide. I wouldn't. Uh, t I'd let. I would just solve the problem that one time without going back and going through the painstaking process of trying to create systems and processes along the way to, so we wouldn't have to answer that question again. I would just answer yep. the question. So it's just easier just for me to do it, or it's easier for me to just tell you what to do. And then they would go do it. But then I surrounded myself with people that were just doing, they weren't thinking for themselves. And that was the biggest hurdle. So um, I'm actually exploring right now, a CEO coach um, outside of CG, just, you know, kind of more of a corporate level. I think that will take me to the next level because, you know, I'm challenging myself now not to get complacent, but you know, my role is to drop, revenue to the bottom line. And uh, we're finding some fun and creative ways to do that. Mark, I got to tell you, this has been a great, honestly, this has been a great interview. You deliver the goods. You really, I know you helped me out with some of the questions that, that I've asked. And I know a lot of people out there are going to take what you put out and it's going to enable them to get from that grow to scale phase. If people wanted to reach out to you or even buy some of your properties, invest in some of your turnkeys, how do they go about doing that? Sure. They can go to mistakefreerealestate.com. Um, we recently wrote a book, um, mistakefreerealestate.com. It's a passive investor's guide to winning with rentals. Um, it really just, for those that want to be hands on. So for those that are entrepreneurial in real estate already, don't buy the book um, or buy the book if you want, but it's more designed to say what my process is and how we protect people from making uh, mistakes in real estate. So for rookies, I guess it would be good. And for those that want to just buy hands off, it's talking about the turnkey experience and how you can buy through a turnkey provider, um, mistake-free real estate, very much tongue in cheek with the idea that, hey, I've made every mistake in real estate, so you don't have to. And buying a turnkey piece of real estate is really the uh, the way to to do it mistake-free. Um, so go to mistakefreerealestate.com, reach out to me. Um, I'm very approachable. You can even click on a link there if you want to send me an email. Um, just, just use the word mentor in the uh, subject heading if you just have a quick question and I'll get back to you. We have a a script that we can actually um, sort those out and, and I'll get back to you. Um, but yeah, always happy to give Billy and, and uh, respect you immensely. Um, love what you're doing and the, the value that you're dropping to everybody. The one thing I will say is, you know, and, and Jason Medley does an amazing job of kind of breeding this into the whole group at Collective Genius, but you live and breathe the go giver mentality. And I appreciate you for that. Thank you're you. so good at, you know, just being an open book, um, you've helped me and I know I've helped you. You know, you and I have had conversations back in the day. I remember when COVID hit and it's like, what are we going to do with leases and tenancy and how do we handle this? And I know we we're able to kind of collaborate on some of that stuff, but you're a go giver and congratulations on the success of the podcast. I know you're driving huge value. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate you today. Enjoy your home office, working from home, using that mind and dropping money to the bottom line, my man. Enjoy it, brother. Thank you. Take care. 
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Unstoppable Real Estate Investing Wealth. My mission is to give you, my listeners, the blueprint to success, the insider secrets for starting, growing, and scaling your real estate investing business so you can experience and live the unstoppable lifestyle. I've made it simple for you. To catapult yourself to success, go to billyssecrets.com. That's B-I-L-L-Y-S secrets.com. There you will find every single tool, tip, trick, strategy, system, and secret used to make millions of dollars as a real estate investor. Everything my team uses and my guests use all in one place for you to tap into so you can start, grow, and scale your real estate investing business. I really hope you implement what you're learning. I hope you utilize these tools, tips, tricks, strategies, and secrets, and I hope to see you on the next episode. God bless. Bye-bye.